Jay, you uh, honor me indeed by allowing me to do this. And uh, as you know, uh, my forte is being the 48-minute ad libber. And uh, I find now that I have that uh, the speaker has so many uh, kudos and has so much credibility that I have to uh, be at a speaker stand and actually read uh, all of the material, otherwise you won't get the full treatment. Um, we are very, first of all, I want to say this, we are very fortunate to have a top-notch police department and fire department, no matter what. <laughs> no matter what the press or these so-called blue ribbon committees uh, to say to you, and these were the same people, by the way, that were asked, and then they volunteered, that went to New York and to help in 911. So just let forget. They asked us for help, and we gave it. Um, Mayor Daley, who always has such a tremendous uh, ability of picking fine people, uh, outstanding people to do the job, uh, has uh, named this speaker the executive director of the Office of Emergency Management and Communications. Now, why did he do this? He did this because uh, the uh, executive director has served nine years on the beat in the police department, walking the beat on some of the most dangerous streets in the city of Chicago. And I don't want you to think that Chicago is an unsafe city, but like every other city, there are certain hip streets that sort of, you know, they're rough, tough places. And if it wasn't for these, this, these uh, tough streets, you wouldn't have any television programs. <laughs> he has assumed um, staff positions in the record keeping and the research and development uh, service. Uh, he has been in the Office of Information and Strategic Services making key decisions. He's the one that developed an integrated criminal justice technology system known as iClear and other modern crime fighting and community policing techniques. Uh, during his tenure in the department, he oversaw the city's emergency management program and communications program, and he, he, and he uh, uh, coordinated the home security and emergency procedures and efforts of the city of Chicago. He has made headlines, and that doesn't make him bad. He's had made national headlines at U.S. Today, New York Times, and the London, London Financial Times promoting Mayor Daley's blueprint for merging security and smart technology to fight crime and the war on terrorism. And this is what makes him tough. He was born in Tel Aviv, so he's an Israeli. 1971, he received a bachelor's degree in English and psychology which means he's literate, from the University of uh, Wisconsin at, at Madison. There are other academic achievements. He has a master's degree from the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business and Social Administration, where he was named the Albert Schweitzer Fellow and a Paul and Daisy Soros Fellow. Uh, the um, speaker has received numerous awards. He's been featured on the CIO Magazine, the Cranes Chicago Business, 40 Under 40, I don't know what that means. <laughs> With regard to women, uh, one of the, he's been named as one of the intelligent, on the, uh, the National Intelligence Warning America System, IWA, uh, uh, the uh, top five in the United States. And he's written on topics from the future of community policing to management principles and policing, and has published several other prestigious, prejudice, prestigious. I have the different wrong glasses today. Uh, journals. <laughs> he has addressed numerous audiences, which he will do today. Uh, throughout his career with Chicago, he has earned the reputation of being an innovator, essential in positioning Chicago as a leader in state-of-the-art crime prevention strategies and homeland security, and we're very, very lucky to have him 
uh, working for the city of Chicago on her behalf, I'd like to introduce to you our speaker, Ron Huberman. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Thank you, Alderman. I think it's going to be a little bit easier to sound eloquent after having your wrong glasses there. So <laughs> I think that's great. He said I was literate. It doesn't necessarily mean eloquent, so I'll have you be the judge today. You know, as being the youngest commissioner in the city of Chicago, I answer to two authorities. I answer to the mayor, and I answer to my mother. I'm normally not very nervous about doing speeches in public, but today my mother and father are actually right there to the left who came today. And that alone, that alone doesn't make me nervous. What does make me nervous is she pulled me aside before the speech and said, if this is dry and not interesting, you're grounded for the weekend. <laughs> so it adds to the pressure here as I have big plans for the weekend. Anyway, it's really, it is an honor for me to be here today at the City Club um, and to address yourselves and the distinguished members of the organization. You know, when I think of organizations, uh, for those of us who try to get the message out and for those of us who try to follow what the city does, it's civic organizations like City Club that are really meaningful and really give an opportunity for different opinions to be heard. And so thank you very much, Jay, for the invite today, and thank you all for coming. You know, what I'd like to talk to you about today is several things. And specifically, I'd like to talk to you about what the role of the Office of Emergency Management Communications is. And given all the headlines recently that we've heard about the 9-11 Commission, I'd like to talk to you about what is it that we as a city should have learned from the 9-11 Commission. It's been out for a while. What are the big picture messages and how can we do reduce those messages to practice here in Chicago to make sure that we're as safe as any big city can be during these times? You know, it's been three years since the 9-11 attacks have occurred and it's been in many ways a very tough three years. But I feel almost for the first time now we're truly trying getting our hands around what it is that we need to do, what we need it is that we need to execute as a city to make sure that we're as safe as that we can be and that we're really in a very strong position. So I'm going to really cover three topics. How the city's organized to deal with large-scale emergencies, what are the emergencies that we are most worried about, and what are we doing to prepare for those emergencies. So in doing this, as a starting point, let me give you a little bit of history about our office. I think I'm going to get hit by this microphone. First I'd like to, is to talk about uh, the OEC. It's something that started in 1995 is when it was created. What makes it interesting that it was created in 1995, and this all weaves into a story when the mayor created the Office of Emergency Communications, is we were really the first major communication system in the whole, uh, in the United States that combined police and fire operations onto one floor. It is now years past the time when 9-11 uh, occurred, and cities like New York, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C. are st still struggling to get police and fire into one operation center. I think in many ways the mayor was a visionary by saying, you know what, we're going to get this done and we got it done well over 10 years ago. Now let's fast forward to post 9-11. In approximately eight months after the attacks in April of 2002, the mayor at that point realized that as a city we needed to reorganize the way that we were structured in order to better deal with the threat of terrorism. And at that point the Office of Emergency Management and Communications was formed to better coordinate emergency planning and response in Chicago. So there's really three major missions that we have at OEMC. The first is 911 operations, and we do 18,000 911 calls a day. It's a pretty staggering number, but 18,000 times a day, someone picks up the phone because they need help. It's our job to make sure that we get them that help in an expeditious manner. Also, in any given moment, we coordinate 4,000 emergency workers in the field, the superintendent's officer, the fire department, emergency management personnel, who are coordinated, determining where they are, where they're going, and who do they need to get to in order to offer assistance. The next big area that we work in is homeland security for the city. Our job here is to develop strategic and emergency plans, making sure that we're doing everything that we can in preparation, and administering homeland security funding and acting as the key point of contact for the Department of Homeland Security. And the third area is emergency management, and it's to coordinate city emergencies, respond to different disasters, and make sure that our response as a city is unified and that we're providing all the resources available to deal with any kind of a crisis. I'd like to take a moment and read to you an excerpt from the 9-11 Commission, which as someone thinking about this from the local perspective, I think does more to inform us about what are the things we should be working on. And the quote goes this way. It says, any attempt to establish a unified command on 9-11 would have been frustrated by the lack of communication and coordination among responding agencies. On 9-11, the problem was less about turf battles on the scene 
It had more to do with command systems designed to work independently and not together. And that quote came from a fireman who was on the scene in 9-11 talking about the issues that they faced. So if we were to reduce, as, a, as locals, thinking about what the 9-11 Commission is telling us down to three things, I think that there's three things that we've learned that we have to get right as a city, and it's just critical. The first is we have to be able to execute on unified command. And what unified command simply means is that when we're making emergencies, when we're making decisions during emergencies, the police can't operate in a silo, fire can't operate in a silo, emergency management can't operate in a silo, nor can public health. All of the key institutions who are charged with all of our safety have to work in a unified and in, in, in a joint manner. Thinking about this in New York City, uh, certainly there's theories that lots of firemen lost their lives because there was not meaningful communication that was able to occur among different command channels. Uh, Chicago has made great progress in this area. So one big lesson that we need to get right is unified command. The other is interoperable communications, something we hear a great deal about. I think that is oversimplified in the media and the way that it's presented to us. I think many people think about interoperable communications is something as simply as a fireman being able to get onto a radio and talk to a policeman or a policeman getting able to talk to a fireman on the radio. For those of us who've been on emergency scenes, we very much realize that one, police, fire, EMS, public health all speak different languages. And the radio zones have so much going on that any attempt to get everyone onto one zone would probably bring us into total chaos. So when we think about interoperable communications, the key is connecting the right people at the right time. And so it's a very complicated issue. It's making sure that the incident commander on the police side and the incident commander on the fire side and on the emergency management side and on the public health side are all able to communicate at the right time to give their respective commands the information that they need. So lesson two, in essence, is making sure we have good interoperable communications. The third area is information sharing. And clearly, we know the implications on the national level, not being able to connect the dots. I would say it should be simpler as a city, but it certainly has its challenges there. And so in information sharing across suspicious individuals, across planning, across a whole variety of areas is the third major lesson that I believe as a city we need to get right. So thinking back now uh, to eight months after September 11th and the way that the city changed the organization of the city to deal with emergencies. I have to tell you, I'm certainly slower than some, but it really took me a while to get it until after I studied the 9-11 Commission for a while. But I thought about the way we are organized as a city and then we, we were reorganized by the mayor at the time, eight months before the 9-11 Commission came out. But we are the only city in the United States to have the same three responsibilities in the same organization. One, emergency management. At the very core function, what we have to do in emergency management and what we do is ensure a unified command. We ensure we have all the right people sharing the right information and coordinating on scene. The second thing that we have in the same organization, being OEMC, is we have emergency communications. In every other city, 911 and the emergency communication system exist in a different organization within cities. In Chicago, it's in one organization. And the third is information sharing. And the role of the Office of Emergency Management Communications is to be the, point, the key point of contact with local and federal government agencies, our partners, on Homeland Security agencies. So when I think about how we're organized as a city, I feel really good about it because we have under one institution all of the responsibilities. So in a way, what that means, if we don't execute on those things, shame on us, because a lot of the territorial issues that may exist in other cities simply do not exist here. And the way we're organized as a city, I believe, is exactly right on the time to help us get through these uh, specific issues. And I'm going to talk about them in a little more detail. So that's a little bit about how we're managed as a city. Let me talk a little bit about what are the things that we're worried about in terms of terrorism? What's on the horizon, potentially? And what is the information that we get? And I really think that there are two things in the very near future that we're worried about, and one has no aha uh -huh factor because it's something that you can read in the cover of the New York Times on a daily basis. But that is the potential for an attack between now and the elections. If we have learned anything, we should take a look at what happened in Spain, what happened with the embassy in Australia, what happened in the UK. And the lesson there is that the terrorists would simply want to find any way to disrupt our electoral process in our democratic society. So one key worry for us between now and the election is to be as vigilant as we can as a city to make sure that we're doing everything we can to stay as safe as we can. The second area that I think is emerging, and it's something that we are devoting significant time and energy and resources into, is the threat of a biological or chemical attack. This is something that uh, intelligence suggests is something on the horizon. It suggests that terrorist organizations have specific means and capacity to potentially try to carry out these attacks. 
Given how new these kinds of attacks are, and given our lack of experience in dealing with these kinds of attacks, it's an area that we're devoting a tremendous amount of energy to on this particular topic. Some of the things that are specifically going on in this area, one is called the City Readiness Initiative. And this is a program that is specifically putting in place personnel, resources, and plans in the event of a crisis to be able to deliver medication to three million Chicagoans in a 48-hour window. You can imagine how complicated that is from moving pharmaceutical stockpiles to coordinating distribution centers to getting medications to those people who otherwise could not go to a distribution center. Uh, the city spending on that one initiative through the federal government over $2 million to develop just that one plan. So it's something we take incredibly seriously and it's something that I believe we've made great progress on in terms of being ready. So those are some of the things we're worried about. So certainly if I was in your shoes as Chicago and I would ask the question, what are you doing to prepare? What concretely has the city of Chicago done in furtherance of being ready for these attacks? And the good news is we've done a great deal and we continue to do a lot. I'd like to talk about four areas that are kind of the core responsibility of emergency management. The first is preparedness, making sure we're prepared for anything that may come our way. The next is what we're doing to prevent an attack. The next is what we're doing in terms of response in the event that we have an attack, how do we respond, and then how do we recover after an attack. These are four areas that all have significant responsibilities associated with them, and they're all areas we're making progress on. So the first one is preparedness. This is a really, really difficult issue. And the reason that it's difficult is that any scenario is possible. I mean, who would have guessed before 9-11 that you'd have aircraft going into buildings? And so therefore, because any scenario is possible, any prevention strategy usually seems pretty reasonable. So the challenge for us here is to build different capacities in different areas. So one of the capacities is how do you extract people from a large building that's collapsed? Whether that building is a train station, an airport, a high rise, we need to build capacity in different areas. We need to develop a capacity in medical triaging. And when we develop these core competencies in these different areas, it allows us to apply those skills and the lessons learned there to a whole variety of potential emergencies that we may be dealing with. So in terms of preparedness, some of the ongoing efforts that are going, the city has something called the Emergency Operations Plan. And the EOP is a plan that really guides us. It's our guidebook of how do we deal with different emergencies. What Chicago has currently done is that we've contracted with a non-for-profit DC think tank to help us do two things. First, to help us think through scenarios we wouldn't otherwise think. And two, to bring to bear international experts from the UK, from Israel, from Northern Ireland, folks who've dealt with this significantly longer than we have, and bring us their insight to make sure that in our planning process, we're not looking inward, but we're looking outward to determine what could happen and to make sure that we're ready. The next thing that we're doing is we're exercising. And this is really critical. Some of you may have seen some of these exercises that were recently in the paper. We did a joint exercise with the special operations of the police department, the fire department, the Department of Environment were there. And we practice, and we practice, and we're doing this on a monthly basis now. The goal there is to find out not what works, but what doesn't work. When we're done with one of these exercises, my staff or others come in and say, hey, we had a great day, it went really well. I want to kick them out of my office as quickly as they came in. Because in a way, then we failed. Because if everything works, we simply didn't discover what doesn't work. And so in terms of the exercises, the mindset that we go in with is let's test the envelope. Let's target what went wrong and let's fix it so that as a city, we become more prepared. We say, did the equipment work? Did our folks have the right training? Uh, did we have the right technology? What was missing? The other area besides exercise then is training and providing all of our first responders with key training. We're about to expand this year to include private security. All of you in the buildings you live in, in your businesses and other locations have private security. If we look at those folks who are part of government in Chicago who are charged with your public safety, there are well over 20,000 people whose core mission is public safety. When we begin to incorporate private security, we grow that army of 20,000 to well over 80,000 people. And it's our goal to begin to harness the power of private security in a lot of ways. And so we're going to be reaching out and we're going to be doing training to help them help us identify suspicious behavior, help them become part of an initial response to mitigate any kind of an emergency. So we think of training much more global. In addition, public education is also key. And here, if we take a look at the recent events in Florida, I think that there's a lot that we can gain and learn from what happened in Florida. We always stress the need to have a emergency kit, which means a family plan. In the event that public communications failed, how many of you actually have a plan where you'd say, this is where I would meet my children? Here's the pre-designated meeting point. There's a great deal that needs to be done in public education to help people prepare. It certainly makes us more ready as a city, and I believe greatly reduces the public's anxiety when responding to emergencies. 
So that's some of what we're doing on the preparedness front. Let me now talk about what we're doing in the prevention front. Whenever we get into prevention, it's really about two things. It's about surveillance and it's about intelligence. And the first thing that comes up immediately is civil liberties, right? People say, you know, big brothers watching. And there's always a lot of anxiety and questions associated with that. I would argue that there's probably a right way and a wrong way to conduct both surveillance and intelligence. Let me ask you all a question to think about. If we had another major attack, think about what civil liberties you would be willing to give up. I think that if we were, if the major attack happened in this country, people would probably be willing to give up a great deal of their civil liberties in order to have a feeling of safety. So given that, and given how important civil liberties are to the very definition of our way of life here in America, I think it's something that we need to think about. And so what we need to identify and think about it would be unobtrusive forms of surveillance as a way to help prevent an attack and safeguard our civil liberties. In essence, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of healing in this case. If we can put in non-obtrusive means to improve our safety now, I think in the long run we'll actually be safeguarding our civil liberties. I said a minute ago that I thought there was a right way to do this and that there's a wrong way to do this. If we think of society as significantly more authoritarian than ours, we can think about the fact that they're not winning the war on terror any more or any less than we are. If we take a look at the onslaught in Russia, two aircraft being targeted, the school children in Russia, right? Certainly something horrific, very hard to imagine. But we certainly know that the Russian government is significantly more authoritarian than ours, much less concerned with the civil liberties that we have in this country, and they have yet to prevent things. If we take a look at the Madrid bombings in Spain, Spain is a country that accepts significantly tougher policing practices than our own, and the train bombings show that they were not immune from this. So the question of civil liberties when we talk in this area, it's not simply a question of how intrusive is government. I think it's in question about how smart is government in strategically using information to make us safer. And I believe, thinking about that, that some of the major initiatives that the city started and the mayor has proposed over the last few years, and actually over the last six months, we have it just right. And that's because they're unobtrusive, they're innovative, and they have an actual real capacity to make us safer as a city. So what are those, uh, some of those unobtrusive forms of surveillance? Well, one of it is the camera initiative that was discussed. And it's the, uh, a camera program that's going to do several things. And I'd like to say all of these cameras are all in the public way when I said unobtrusive. They're on streets, they're on alleys, they're on sidewalks. First thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be tying over 2,000 cameras that already exist among different city departments into one meaningful network that can be centrally monitored. We're going to also be utilizing smart software technology. Around key infrastructure, we want to identify what cars are there to potentially look for license plates that could hit on a terrorist watch list. We want to see if someone's leaving packages. We want to be able to identify a lot of key variables. And cameras very much act as a force multiplier. They give us the opportunity to see a lot of things in real time and react as a city in real time. So by using smart software and technology, by networking all of these cameras, I believe we're making a real significant difference in being safer. We're also the first city in the country to integrate these cameras into 911. And actually, we've discovered here we will be the first 911 center in the world to do this. If we think about how technology is reshaping our lives and how we're becoming a very multimedia society, I would ask if I asked for a hand how, who's got a camera, who's got a uh, phone that's got a camera, I'd probably get a significant show of hands here. And so what we're hoping to do is capitalize on that new technology and be able to use it to make Chicago and safer. So in the future, in the next 18 months, when you call 911, if you are calling in the vicinity of one of our 2,000 plus cameras, the call taker on the other end of that line is going to instantly get that image. It's going to be able to see, in many cases, what you see. So if you call and say someone's being robbed, someone's being raped, someone's being attacked, on the platform of the blue line, the 911 center is going to be able to instantly get that image and provide the right information to the superintendent's folks to guide them exactly where they need to be and who they need to be looking at. And so they have a very significant homeland security implication and they have a very significant crime implication. When we weigh out on something like this, the implications of weighing the perception of Big Brother versus the real security that we gain, in my opinion, it's not a real balance in the sense that the real safety we gain far outgains perception about cameras on the public way. Other systems in terms of surveillance that are not obtrusive and are very, very meaningful are also in the works and on the way. The Chicago Department of Public Health has put in the process of putting in an electronic system to capture who comes into our emergency rooms. In the event of a bioterror attack, it's going to be very critical very early on to realize what is the symptoms, who's coming in, and how should we respond as a city. 
In terms of information sharing, an initiative of the Chicago Police Department is iClear, Illinois Citizen Law Enforcement Analysis and Reporting. It is the first of its kind databases in the United States in the sense that it takes information from every law enforcement agency in the state when it's fully complete and allows everyone to query that information. The pinnacle example that we give of how the system will work when it's fully operational is the following. Let's say that you have two males, very suspicious, by a ComEd facility in southern Illinois. They're stopped by, by, by a uh, state trooper, and that state trooper goes to conduct an interview and documents the stop and says, okay, the following car, Illinois license plate 12345, was stopped at ComEd at so and so time doing the following suspicious behavior. Uh, at that point, that officer may not have probable cause to hold these individuals, and there may be no reason to do so. But let's say two days later, a Chicago police officer stops these same two individuals by a ComEd facility in Chicago engaging in the same kind of behavior. It's connecting that kind of information that would arm that Chicago cop, or it could be vice versa, with critical information they need to start asking serious questions. Does this warrant more attention? Is this something that we need to be focusing on? And so the iClear system allows us to begin on a very local level connecting the dots. The other thing that iClear allows us to do is by capturing massive amounts of information from law enforcement, it allows us to aid our federal partners. While we don't always get information coming downstream, and that's often a complaint from law enforcement, although it's gotten significantly, significantly better since immediately post 9-11, it also allows us to provide our federal partners with a lot of critical information in terms of looking at suspicious patterns and suspicious behaviors that they may want to be privy to. And so it's something, again, that I believe is an unobtrusive technology, but it's a technology that has real value. It makes us safer. It allows us to act in a smarter manner and truly determine behavior that could be terrorist related versus behavior that could be someone just stopping their car in a place that's by a critical facility. The other area that we've been working on is response. And obviously, if something happens, we need to be prepared to, uh, to respond to that incident, and we need a meaningful response. And Chicago has really moved light years ahead in this area as well. We have a very sophisticated joint operations center. With a joint operations center, it's a place when during a time of emergency we activate, and all of the city's leadership comes together in this one center to help determine strategically what is the best course of action. At the Joint Operations Center, the superintendent's there, the fire commissioner's there, um, the mayor staff, uh, key uh, commissioners from all the departments come together, the utilities are there. We immediately come together, look at all the information, and are able to make, in a very real-time fashion, important decisions of how we're going to manage the emergency. What makes that so critical is what we call the information fog. Early on in every crisis, the one thing that we've learned is there's always a fog of information. You get a ton of misinformation, and it's very hard to get at the root of what is actionable. What is it that we need to do as a city right now to mitigate loss of life and to respond appropriately? By having this area that pulls in all the information and has all the key players, it significantly speeds up our capacity to make those decisions in short order that I think make a real difference. The other thing, the mayor announced a new concept of delivering government service a couple of months ago in the terms of an operations center. When the mayor presented this particular uh, operations center, it was a really interesting idea because the theory is the following, is that we need to bring government agencies together in the way we deal with day-to-day -day issues. And what that will mean is then when we deal with larger scale issues, all the players are already working together. So the operations center, which will be a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week center, will be a place where not only do we monitor the surveillance equipment such as the cameras, but we also monitor and make sure that all city departments are reacting in a unified manner to emergencies. So something as simple as a water main break, for example. It requires traffic control. It requires infrastructure departments to meet together to manage that incident. It requires streets and sanitation to tow vehicles away. So the operations center will be doing everything from managing something as simple as a water main break to something as large as large-scale emergencies. It's something that will be live by in this upcoming summer. Uh, it will use a great deal of technology and I think is going to be a really interesting thing to watch because I think what we're going to discover is the speed with which city services are delivered will be greatly enhanced by having that center there. We also have been uh, increasing, will continue to increase the amount of emergency coordinators that we have as a city. These are the folks who go on scene, help ensure unified command, and coordinate all the different city agencies during all large and small emergencies. And what we've discovered is the more people work together in terms of government, and the more unified we can make that work, we're able to take what is good service and make it significantly better service. Other areas of preparedness uh, for response that we work with is the capacity with the medical community to design and have meaningful triage if we have large-scale casualties. We have new communication tools in terms of radio systems. We have a lot of new ways to communicate with the public 
during large-scale emergencies. Some of those systems include an emergency alert system, which allows us to take over the airwaves. I have to tell you, this is one that's very tempting on many a day, but we show restraint here for a true emergency. Uh, we have an emergency telephone bank to get information out to people about where you'd find your loved ones. In fact, uh, HIPAA threw us a little curveball there because we could no longer offer people information about what hospitals their loved ones are in. And so we recently partnered with the American Red Cross, who's been a great partner of ours. Uh, they are exempt from the HIPAA laws so that we can continue to offer folks information on their loved ones during an, an emergency. And I cannot tell you how critical this is uh, because, a perfect example, the other day we had a, an amb a bus accident with 30 people hurt. A lot of families wanted to know, how is my loved one? And luckily there were very minor injuries and so people were able to communicate out to their own families. But during a large scale emergency, the last thing we want to do is put people through prolonged trauma by not knowing where they can go find the loved ones, the status of their loved ones. And so we take this mission very seriously. We have the 911 callback system. We can make a thousand calls a minute to a geographic area with the reverse message. And we might tell you shelter in place, we might tell you move, but again, it's another way utilizing the phone system to push information back out to people of what an impending emergency is. And finally, the last mission that we've been working on is recovery. And really, recovery is something that's often overlooked. But I think here's something that there's a lesson that we need to take out of the pages of how Israel deals with terrorism. If we think that the primary goal of terrorists is to disrupt our way of life to the degree that we can recover from any kind of attack, in a very short order is to the degree that we disrupt their capacity to hurt us. In Israel, and we've, we've studied the way they do a lot of these things, one of the things they do is you may have a bomb go off in a store. By that afternoon, the street is cleaned up, the glass is replaced, and if that business can be back in business, they are back in business. And the message that that sends is that our way of life will not be disrupted. So we take recovery as something that we need to think about very proactively so that if we were attacked, the basic services of the city would not be disrupted. It mitigates the economic cost of a terrorist attack and it ensures that the psyche of the city doesn't go into, so to speak, a spin because we're able to restore services and keep basic functions going. So some of the things that we look at in the area are obviously all the utilities, working very carefully with the utilities to make sure that we have redundancy, that we have multiple ways to deliver those basic services. We look at the way we interact with the business community regarding notifications, tenant information, the way that we would work with the federal government to bring significant and heavy resources to the city in a short amount of time were we to have an attack. We take a look at debris management and removal. And we take a look at it now because obviously after an attack, it's too late at that point to try to say what contracts would we have in place? How would we have the right tools and equipment in place to deal with these emergencies? And so again, we're trying to get that all done on the front end with the hopes that we never have to use it. So back to the first question I asked, are we prepared as a city? I would say that given these uncertain times, I would say that we are certainly prepared as any large city can be. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me and I'm gonna indulge you for one second and I know Jay wants me to open up to questions and answers. A lot of the work that the Office of Emergency Management and Communications do, I'm very lucky because I get to be the face in front of the organization but I have a tremendous team who put their heart and soul in. And I often say they adopt me as the director because these are folks who see folks just like me come and go, but day in, day out, they're the ones who carry out the mission and simply make sure it gets done. So I'm gonna have you indulge me for a second while I recognize who these folks are. Uh, Ted O'Keefe here, who's a cabinet member on his own right, but he runs the 311 system. And as many of you know, his facility is the backup to 911, which we recently has to use. Ted does a tremendous job, and I know he's here. I just don't see where he's at. Ted? Okay, maybe Ted's not here. Well, in that case, let me tell you the truth about Ted. Yeah. Yeah. Just joking, but Ted does great. Barb McDonald is here. Many, many of you may remember Barbara. She was the highest ranking civilian woman in the Chicago Police Department as deputy superintendent. I'm very lucky to have her at the OMC as my top advisor. Barbara has been my partner in crime since uh, 1999. Uh, I would be lost without her and she's great. Two people who are not here is Lori Lightfoot, who's uh, Chief of Staff and General Counsel, Andrew Velasquez, who runs the 911 operation. Um, other people here, I, I talked about the City Readiness Initiative, Karen Rowan, who was formerly with the Police Department, is right there, and she runs the bioterror effort. Adrian Hegel, to my left, who comes from Budget Management, all that good Homeland Security money. Jim Argelopoulos, where's Jim? Jim's right there. there. Let me tell you something, a quick, a quick thing about Jim. 
He's known as the original go-to guy at OEMC. There's always a go-to guy when nothing else gets fixed. I have people who are my right hand and I have people who are my left hand. There are many days where Jim is both hands and I cannot thank him enough for all the tremendous work that he does. And Jim, all the fantastic technology that we've had there, uh, Jim has been running it. The face of OEMC besides myself was Monique Bond, who many of you see, and uh, I cannot thank her enough for helping us with the positive image that we have. And I'm not going to go here forever, but let me just name names of folks who are here, and I'll just have them stand up for one second. Tammy Sepulveda, Eric Rausch, Tony Ruiz, Dave Doherty, Cynthia Krukowski, Cheryl Pesca, and Lupe Diaz are all part of my team, and they do a great job. I cannot thank them enough. So following the, uh, the, the way it goes, we're going to open up for questions and answers now. We simply ask that you walk up to the microphone, since this will be for cable, and uh, go ahead and shoot away questions that you may have. And the first taker. Now just I'll remind you, sir, about a little etiquette. You always start with a simple question to warm up. <laughs> I'm a short. Anyway, sir, uh, great info. Uh, one of the uh, idiom they say, uh, the terrorists will kill one and scare up 10,000. Uh, how in your, uh, is, is good, a lot of good information, prepared prevention, in terms of keeping the panic in the city, and you know that traffic uh, is a nightmare. Uh, is there any plan as far as uh, how to address this issue? Thanks, sir. Great, great question. The, the, the issue was about panic, how do we keep this, uh, the city in the terms of a terror attack from panicking? And what do we do with the traffic? Because clearly people self-evacuate from the loop. I feel good in essence that we have two things. One of the key lessons that we've learned from looking at a lot of different emergencies, it is critical to get the message out early about what's going on. Literally within minutes of an attack, it is our goal and our mission to get as much information out there. And this could be a natural, this could be man-made, but getting a very clear and concise message to the public very early on is important so that people have the right information. We also have a variety of evacuation plans in the city that allow us to utilize the resources of the Chicago Police Department, the Illinois State Police, Chicago Department of Transportation, Illinois Department of Transportation, CTA, Metro, all have sat down and worked together and asked the question, how would we go about evacuating the city in an emergency if we had to do it? And we have a plan in place. It's something that's practiced, and it's something that I believe would make a egress from the city very meaningful. Again, these are all things we hope we never have to use, but if we do, we have the tools in place to make sure it's orderly. Yes, sir. I'm glad to hear what the city is doing to evacuate, but aside from having an emergency kit and an evacuation plan, what can we as individuals do to avoid becoming victims instead of having to recover afterwards? It's a great question. One of the, one of the things I'd like to recommend is a website, www.ready.gov. It's a Homeland Security sponsored site that I think does the most thorough job of really sharing with folks what it is that you need to be as prepared as you can be in any kind of an emergency. And so I'd recommend going to that website. The thing that you can do for us, and we always ask this and push this, is when you see something suspicious, people often say, should I call 911? Should I not call 911? Should I report it? Should I not? If you have that feeling in your stomach, should this be something that I report, we ask, please, please, please call 911. Let us dispatch folks. Let us investigate. We would much rather err on the side of caution than otherwise. And so I think the most critical things that we can all do as a city is be alert and aware for anything that looks out of the ordinary. And when you see it, call us so that we can investigate. Right. Other questions? Any questions? Going once, going twice. Okay.